and now we can start. So welcome everyone once again. Thank you for joining us today in this edition of the online meetups, also known as the virtual movies. This is our first session for December. And again, it's my pleasure to host these events for you, for our community. And I hope that you enjoy our great speaker today, Chris Hughes. And with that, we're going to make one small disclaimer. Once again, remember your feedback is what drives the meetups. At the end of the session, you will get a survey in your email. And once you fill that survey, we will read it through and we will make sure that we're addressing those topics that you want to hear about. With that said, we're going to move on into the next slide. You already know them, the meetup leaders for this online meetup. You have Manik and Suyo in America, you have Royson Lobo in APAC, and you have myself, Angel, here in EMEA region. With that said, some kind reminders here for training and certification. Go to training.milsoc.com. You can see the learning paths there. Remember the new MCD certification, it's been two months already. And for any training queries that you may have, any training issue with vouchers or problems that you are having, go to help.learn.musoft.com in that URL so that you can request and open a new ticket for your request. Any doubts that you have, you do have two ways, the help.musoft.com and the Stack Overflow community, especially when you're thinking about data with a new runtime. Typical guidelines that we always discuss, pop your questions in the chat and anyone in the community can try to answer. And any of the remaining questions will be asked in your behalf at the end of the session. All the sessions that we do are recorded and you will see them both in the Virtual Mulis YouTube channel. You can subscribe or you can go into the Meetups page and you will see the video session there. It's probably uploaded by midday tomorrow. Keep that in mind. And again, your feedback is what drives the content of these meetups. So let us know how it went. How, what did you like? What you didn't enjoy? So that we. Now, one of the favorite sessions uh, sections, the announcements and a very quick recap. Pre-alpha tutorial. I'm not going to put much time into this one. Remember, you can access your from your browser some online data with function where you have the tutorial in the left part of the screen, and you do have as well the code snippets of data we in the right. There's the disclaimer. It's not an officially support Microsoft product. It's there in very bright yellow. It's not supported by Microsoft support, and you won't be able to open Microsoft support cases for this suite. There are no SLA responses, but you can actually do and push your uh, the issues that you report and how to solve them. On the next topic, the hackathon, the submissions are over, but worry not, are going to in this period. We have Anna Grace, Director of uh, AI Artificial Intelligence in Facebook, and we have Jennifer Rosenberg from the BD Tech Ops uh, role and Chief of uh, MicroStrategy. For all the full list of judges, the role and how is it going to move on from there, you can access that blog post. Again, it's shared in the slides. I will, after this session, again, put the link to the slides, introduction slides. I have all the URLs and you will be able to see them yourself. So a quick recap of the judges. You have here everyone that is working from Millsoft. You have Sanja, which is our product manager from Anypoint Studio and Runtime. You have other people that are evangelists, as Stephen Fishman in all the area that is Amer. And you have Alex Tidum. He also presented here a couple of times and is a very well-known instructor ecosystem. Um, Another point that is interesting, moving away from the hackathon, the mastering your troubleshooting skills. This is a one to two hour session with Muse of Engineering and support. And they're going to show you how best to address troubleshooting with the Muse of and the complexity of any integration platform. So you will get there's the four main points highlighted there, the how to quickly diagnose and resolve any problem, how to successful troubleshoot, and how to work best with the Muse of support. 
There will be some mention of different tools that you can use for troubleshooting. And all of this is going to be shared with you. This is Slide Deck. You will have it and you can access these URLs. There's two sessions, three sessions more coming week. So keep that in mind and make sure that you then if you're interested. Now, uh, exciting uh, news on the AnyPoint Studio 6.6.7. It was released on November 26. And these are some of the new features that they are there. I have to warn you as we are in here community, Mac OS 11.x Big Sur is not compatible with AnyPoint Studio 6. So if you are still working with AnyPoint Studio 6, please do not upgrade yet. I haven't checked in the last week if this has been addressed, but be aware of this potential issue. There's a links there on where to download the new Studio 6.6.7. And this one was focused mostly on bug resolutions and new features. Now, there's another release that happened two weeks ago, November 23rd, the RTF on EKS and AKS with the version of RTF 1.8. You have more information in the release and the public the documentation release page for the Mules of Docs. And in case you're wondering and you're having any doubts around what is this release about, you can check one of our previous virtual Muli session that was made with Arno Bruman and Anu Vijay. Oh, the, the surname of Anu is always complex for me, Vijay Mohan from Zero to Watch and containerizing the Mule frontend. I included the link there so you can check all, that the, all the things that are new in this release and how to make sense out of them. Uh, again, this is EKS and AKS release. There are some others planned. I know that there's some people are interested in the Google, Google pro provisioning and in the OpenShift. These are not included in this November release. Uh, some news on the Friends of Mac series. There's a new release on AnyPoint Community Manager installation. You can go into that video. It's less than 14 minutes and you will get an explanation on how to install. And there is the walkthrough on the different steps that you need to install the Community Manager in case that you're working with the product. Okay, we're already eight minutes in, and I know Chris time, it's, uh, I'm already abusing your time, Chris. I'm sorry for that. We're going to close very quickly. The new connectors and update, you have these uh, slides for reference. These are what's new in the last month, all these releases for the different connectors. You can check the release notes in case that you are working with some of those. Lastly, for next week, we do have Stephen Wu, once again, an expert guide to exposing APIs in Runtime Fabric. This is happening next week. It's going to be APAC Asia-based, so that for people based in Europe, it's not going to be great. Okay, with that said, we're going to open up for you, Chris, using the Mule for Java SDK to build a connector. That is what we have for today's session. And for those of you that don't know Chris, he's one of our uh, customer success architects. He's an enthusiastic software professional with in-depth knowledge of working alongside in technical teams, leading technical teams and delivering solutions that are both on plan and on budget. His background also includes a broad range of experience leading organizations everywhere in Australia, Europe, and the US. So he's basically covering all the areas that we're covering with these meetups. Uh, excellent. Uh, with that said, I will leave it the stage up to you, Chris. And just so that everyone knows, we're having a trivia at the end of the session after the Q&A. I will stop sharing my screen and you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you once again, Chris, for making the time for the community and thank you for everyone that is joining. No problem. Yeah, thank you very much, Angel. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, you'll notice that kind of all of the different countries that I have worked in, they all speak English. And I'm afraid that's that's my uh, Achilles heel is uh, kind of my language skills are pretty poor when it comes to speaking anything other than English. I'm afraid uh, you definitely have the 
hands up on me there. So, uh, so yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh, as Angel mentions, I'm a customer success architect. I work in the same team as Angel, in fact, I'm kind of based in the UK. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the Mule 4 SDK. Um, kind of my background, I've done lots of Java in the past. I'm assuming that many of the people on the call will have as well. Um, actually, most kind of before joining, uh, joining MuleSoft, I actually worked at DocuSign. So um, kind of what we'll see is um, as we go through our exercise today, I'm going to be demonstrating and looking at the code behind a DocuSign connector. So kind of leveraging some of my previous experience at DocuSign but also bringing that to bear in the MuleSoft world as well. Okay, so here's the agenda for what I'm uh, intending to cover today. So a uh, bit of an introduction here. What is a connector? I think uh, probably we all know that, yeah, given uh, that we're attending a uh, sort of Muley meter. Um, then looking at sort of how does that differ when it comes to Mule 4 versus Mule 3? Um, some best practices around building a connector if we choose to go down that path. Then if we are building a connector, looking at the object model, um, and particularly of interest here is, how do I put together my code? What, what are the appropriate objects that I'm making use of in order for things to appear in, in the right place within AnyPoint Studio, and ultimately, you know, kind of when it comes to the runtime as well? Um, how to build our extension, yeah. And then we'll, as I say, we'll have a look at some code here. So uh, it's not gonna be a huge amount of code, but. But I want, what I want to highlight here is we can actually make an extension, you know, kind of if you have a Java class today and you think, yeah, I'd really like to be able to expose that functionality inside of the Mule runtime engine, you may well do that today kind of using the Java extension module. Um, but actually through, you know, kind of a pretty small piece of additional code, you might be able to turn that into a, a, a module or an extension to the Mule runtime, and that way make it more easily consumable for other developers, yeah? Um, so many of us may be Java developers. However, you know, kind of there are also many MuleSoft developers that don't have in-depth knowledge of Java. So if you can make it available to other members of your team or other teams, then, you know, kind of that can, that can be very beneficial. Um, and then sort of once we've had a look at the code, we'll see, okay, based upon the code that we've seen, how does that actually appear when we're making use of that particular connector within AnyPoint Studio? So kind of soup to nuts, kind of um, top to bottom is, you know, kind of you'll see everything that I have in this connector. It's quite a simple connector, but that's an intentional thing is that what we can do is we can focus on, you know, kind of what are the surrounding pieces that I need in order to build a connector rather than the details of, okay, you know, kind of what is the code in terms of the operation itself. Okay, so let's jump in. So what is a connector? Um, I, I think we're all pretty comfortable with sort of what a connector is within MuleSoft. But just to re-emphasize, so Mule 4 provides a well-defined mechanism to extend the runtime. Um, and I think key to this really is kind of understanding some of the architectural work that we've done between Mule 3 and Mule 4. Um, you know, kind of pretty much everything that you see inside of Mule 4, aside from, you know, the real core runtime engine, is actually built as an extension to the runtime engine now. Yeah, so it makes it easy for us to add in things. So things like the HTTP um, connector that I'm sure everyone on this call will have used, that is implemented as a module and it's an extension to the Mule runtime. Yeah, um, the email connector, database connectors, Salesforce connectors, all of those are built using this same SDK that we're going to look at today. Um, doesn't have to be connectors that we build as extensions, and a good example of that is the validations module. Yeah, so so even when we're extending the Mule runtime, very often it will be for the purposes of building a connector, but it can be to build anything else, incorporate any you know kind of piece of Java functionality that you have. The extensions module provides you a way to do that, so that and as I say, you know, can we can make it available potentially to a wider audience. So looking at Mule 4 against Mule 3. So there are some differences here. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that kind of your Mule applications themselves, you know, kind of there is a migration process to go through when it comes to migrating those over onto Mule 4. And very much is the same with the SDK as well, yeah? So, so the same architectural changes that have been made have an impact here also. So the Mule 4 SDK replaces what we had as the dev kit in Mule 3 days, yeah? The dev kit is not available in Mule 4. 
And also Mule 4, um, you know, kind of things that we do in Mule 4 don't go back to Mule 3 either. So uh, I'm afraid there isn't, you know, kind of any direct compatibility there. However, that said, so Mule 4 provides two flavors of SDKs. So we're going to be looking at the Java SDK, which gives us, you know, kind of real fine grain control over what we want to do. Um, worth noting that there is an XML SDK as well. Um, so that's primarily for if you want to, um, you know, kind of pull together essentially things that might look a bit like flows in other ways. Yeah. So we've, we've got an XML configuration file. You can plumb things together and then actually package that up as, a, as a, its own module if you want to. Yeah. Um, the Mule 4 SDK makes pretty heavy use of Java annotations. Yeah, so uh, so if you are uh, sort of going down the road of building out uh, kind of an extension module and a connector, yeah, um, then you are going to sort of be making use of Java annotations. Um, many of you will be familiar with what a Java annotation is, but if any of you aren't familiar with what that is, it's basically a sort of a mechanism within the Java language of kind of reducing the amount of code I have to write. I can use an at and then kind of name a particular predefined annotation. And essentially that's a way of saying, okay, this Java uh, class that I'm writing, um, it implements a particular interface without me having to go through and kind of write out that code. So even though it may appear visually, if, when I look at that, that there might be some magic going on behind the scenes, if we like, yeah, this is just kind of a, star, a standard Java um, sort of mechanism to say, okay, without me having to write lots of, you know, kind of code here, if I want to implement an interface and I don't have any particular overrides that I want to apply, then I can use this idea of an annotation basically to simplify the code that I write as a developer. Um, also worth noting, so, you know, kind of particularly if you think about things like an HTTP connector, an email connector, those are pretty rich in functionality, yeah? So they've got lots of capabilities, lots of configuration options around them, yeah? Um, as I say, they are built using the, the Mule 4 SDK. So that gives you a sense of what's possible and it's definitely more flexible than what we had um, back in the Mule 3 dev kit days. So it supports things like transactions, dynamic configurations. Um, you can see the list here. The one that I will particularly highlight here is the idea of the class loading isolation. Yeah? So uh, the way that the extension module works is it takes care of um, kind of any sort of possible issues that you might run into in terms of class loading conflicts. Um, many of you, if you are Java developers, will be familiar with this idea that, you know, kind of, you might be, you know, kind of, and, and certainly it happened in, in mule days as well in the past, yeah, is you've got a class that you've loaded in via one jar file, perhaps an extension makes use of you know, the same jar file, but a different version or something like that. And then you get conflicts in terms of the class file that's loaded into the Java virtual machine. Yeah. So as part of the Mule 4 SDK, if you're using this extensions module, yeah, so the, the Mule sort of infrastructure, if you like, takes care of the isolation of class loading so that you won't get those conflicts that, that may have otherwise occurred. Yeah. Um, which is a nice thing for us. It means that when we're building an extension, we can be confident that the version of a library that we might choose to include within our extension, we're not going to run into any incompat incompatibilities down the line if someone's using a different version of that library. So best practices as well. And, and I think this is important when it comes to connectors. Yeah. So a connector's purpose, as we say here, is to bring the target system into Mule. Yeah. If your connector is going to be used by someone other than yourself, and hopefully it will be, yeah, we want it to be an experience that is comfortable and familiar to Mule developers, yeah. So we we don't want it to appear that okay, by by making use of this connector, you know, kind of I really need to understand exactly how that external system works, yeah. Um, we're, we're somewhat defeating the purpose of our connector if if we're doing that. So as much as you can. Think about, okay, I want to present the connector to the user of it in a way that is going to feel natural to them if they're a MuleSoft developer. So, you know, kind of certainly we, we will want to capture parameters and things like that, but make it be things that, you know, kind of logically make sense rather than kind of understanding the intricate detail of that external system. Um, I think reasonably obvious, yeah, so we don't want it 
sort of the code within our connector to be specific to a particular use case. Um, you know, kind of that if, if you are writing some code for that type of scenario, you'd be better off using the Java extension module. Um, if you're building a connector, you want it to be, you know, something that can be reused multiple times, yeah? Um, so very much following the, you know, kind of API-led approach, yeah? Uh, in that we're building this for reuse. Um, and then a couple of notes regarding coding rules, yeah? So make sure that you're building your um, sort of code designing for thread safety. Um, primarily what we're saying here is, you know, kind of unless there's a real need to, don't spawn any additional threads in order to do work within your uh, sort of connector or extension. Um, and then the last three here, I think are just kind of good practice anyway, yeah? Um, still possible to do these, um, but certainly we would very much recommend against it, yeah? So what you don't want to do when you're building a connector is rely on kind of other things happening within the flow in a particular way, yeah? So don't rely on particular variables being present within the flow. Um, don't use attributes of a message as parameters coming in, yeah? Because if it's if it's a different type of message that uh, you know kind of is coming in, you know kind of potentially your code is going to fall over. Yeah, don't access the mule context. Yeah, so don't rely on what else is happening within our mule flow. Yeah, make your connector be as independent as possible. Doesn't mean that we can't put configuration around it, but in, and in fact that's the right way to approach it. Have configuration that is part of making use of your module rather than relying on other things being present within the flow. Okay, so if you're looking to build an extension, um, so using a, a module here and whether it's a connector or not, um, if you go across to the documentation and we'll kind of flick over there briefly, yeah, so there's some good documentation on sort of getting started with the Mule uh, SDK, yeah. Um, it will give you things like, okay, here's a Maven commands to run to, you know, kind of generate a project. Um, just be aware that sort of what you're going to get when you do that is very much a starting point yeah, for, for your extension. Yeah, it, it's not going to write any code for you. It's just putting together some of the scaffolding yeah, for, for your work. So come back over here. Yeah. So this diagram actually is taken from that documentation. And I think it's really important that if you are looking to build an extension, you understand how these different objects within the model interact with each other. Um, and actually, I think it's worthwhile just kind of walking through, um, you know, kind of where these sit within AnyPoint Studio as well. So kind of our module is our entry point, yeah, for, for our extension to the Mule runtime. So, so that's our top level class, if we like, yeah. Um, so what you'll see in this diagram, you'll see that there are solid lines between things. I think when you first look at this diagram, the temptation is to look at that and say, oh, okay, well, if I'm building an extension module, presumably I must have a configuration and I must have a connection provider, yeah? And I must have some components. Well, I think it's probably true to say that if you don't have any components, kind of I would question why you're building an extension, yeah? But all the rest of these things are optional, yeah? So, um, you know, kind of, and, and we'll look at where these sit in AnyPoint Studio so that we have an understanding of these. So let me just come over to Studio, yeah? Now, apologies if uh, kind of it's not too easy to see the screen here, so I'll try and expand this out a bit. So when we're building an extension or a module, yeah? So our modules are these things that we see sort of over in our Mule palette, yeah? So is the HTTP module, for example, yeah? Um, our components, and this is how they're explained within that object model as well, are kind of these operations or components that I have sort of within the context of a module, yeah? If I come down, so I've got a uh, sort of an HTTP listener component selected here within my mule flow, yeah? And I can see that, okay, there is a, and apologies, this won't, probably won't be very clear, but a connector configuration, so a configuration object here, yeah? Um, and also I've got, so in this case, um, I've got a parameter which is the path, yeah, that I'm, so that my uh, listening component, yeah, it's listening on this particular URI, yeah? So all of those things that we've covered there are the things that we're talking about within this object model. So when you're building an extension, 
think about how would you want that to be represented with any within any point studio yeah which things does it make sense to be parameters which which parameters might i want to put within a configuration object yeah um so typically we think of configuration objects as being things like you know if i'm thinking of my http listener for example it's what's the host and port information yeah those are parameters within the configuration object yeah um, the the path that we saw yeah so that uri yeah that was a parameter that defined at the component level yeah if we're thinking about a database connector then definitely we're going to have connection providers and the reason that we do that is because we know that establishing a connection with a database is something that firstly can take some time but also makes use of resources on the database side so having a connection provider means that okay i, I don't want to connect once when to run one sql statement then drop that connection and then the next time i've got a sql statement establish a new connection i want to pull those connections because it will it'll help with performance yeah so all of these things are available to you but you don't have to use all of them yeah so very much when you're thinking about building an extension think about how would i want this to be represented within any point studio and that will give you a good idea of right okay which of these objects are going to make sense for me yeah it's entirely possible that you might say okay i'm just going to have a component and some parameters that go along with that and i don't need a configuration object maybe that you've got a configuration object with some parameters and you don't have any parameters down at the component level and in fact that's how the connector that we're going to look at works yeah so configuration objects very often they are sort of authentication information as well so if we think about a salesforce connector for example yeah i'm entering in sort of username password you know kind of those types of uh, pieces of information there yeah so so that's very often where we have sort of configuration objects coming to play is where we're storing that level of information that is going to be reused in multiple places yeah so if we think of that http example again yeah so i've got a, a configuration that i'm potentially going to use across multiple different operations within my flow okay so as i say these are the core things that we have within the sdk um, definitely worthwhile spending some time mapping out how you anticipate this working and as i say just want to highlight here is not all of these are required things yeah they they fulfill a particular purpose within the extension sdk yeah you don't have to have all of them yeah you have to have a module yeah because that's our top level extension class but pretty much everything else is optional from that point on okay so how to build your extension well we've already seen that documentation um so you know can i definitely have a look at that um, you know, kind of, it, there is some great information there, kind of particularly sort of when it comes to this session. However, I think, you know, kind of very often as developers, we often kind of want to see, OK, can you show me an example of what that looks like? It's kind of easier for me to see some code and understand how that fits things together. So so hopefully what we're doing today will kind of help you down this path. But the documentation is there um, and some good detail. It's kind of useful to have that understanding of, right, can I get an understanding of what the, that object model is before you start down the path of reading the documentation in detail so that you're clear on that in your own mind? There is a section in the documentation that talks about that structure, and, I, and that's certainly the one that I would recommend reading first and making sure that you have a clear understanding of that because that will help you to build out your extension. Um, so again, a reminder here, so it should be a generic thing that's extending the mule runtime. Yeah, It shouldn't be something that is implementing a specific use case. If you have got a bit of code that's implementing a specific use case, it's probably not best to build it as an extension. Yeah, Maybe just have a, a call out and, and use the Java module yeah, to, to say, okay, I want to make a call out to this class. This implements something you know, kind of that I've chosen to implement that way. So, so not all Java classes are necessarily candidates for extensions, but many of them may be. Yeah. 
Um, and so there are some great examples uh, kind of that on, up on GitHub as well. So lots of the uh, kind of mule code, um, as many of you will be aware, is up on GitHub. So the HTTP connector, the email connector, yeah, those are public repositories on GitHub. So if you want to see how those are implemented and really um, sort of get into the detail of how those are implemented, then the code is there for you to do so. Um, what I would kind of caution briefly, however, is those are quite complex examples. So, you know, kind of if you're building your first extension, they may not be the best examples to look at because, you know, kind of by their nature, they are very complex modules and complex connectors. So you may want to start with something a little bit simpler. And in which case, you're very welcome to have a look at um, kind of my much, uh, I think it is a, a pretty basic connector. But kind of the same concepts apply there, and it may be a simpler thing to start with. Yeah. So again, um, what we're going to look at today, this DocuSign connector, that's also up on GitHub. Yeah. So feel free to to have a look at that code, and we're going to have a look at it anyway. But you know, kind of uh, um, feel free to go and sort of dig through that in a bit more detail if you want to sort of understand how everything fits together. Um, so why build a DocuSign connector? Yeah, so um, if any of you have used the DocuSign, so DocuSign in case people aren't aware, it's a, an electronic signature service. Um, so completely cloud hosted and it already exposes a REST API. So, you know, kind of very um, valid question to say, okay, well, what's the purpose behind building a DocuSign connector? Because I already have a REST API that I can use. Um, what I've done as part of this connector is I've chosen to build a connector that's based around the authentication part of the process. Yeah. Um, so the DocuSign uh, REST API, um, very good API, um, but their authentication process is slightly more complex than some. Yeah. So it's based upon JWT or JOT, um, sort of that authentication process, which itself is an extension to OAuth. Yeah. But they have some kind of quirks to the way that they've um, kind of decided to use it. So they have this idea of what their DocuSign terms an, an integrator key, which is very similar to the idea of a client ID that we might be familiar with building our own APIs. But sort of along with that, they've kind of built in this review process where, you know, kind of if you want to make use of an integrator key, um, kind of you have to then submit your code for review. Um, sort of it gets reviewed automatically by some back-end processing at DocuSign. And essentially, you know, there's more involved in this than, than typically would be the case than just requesting a client ID. Um, so, you know, kind of for that reason, I, I thought there was, uh, it would be beneficial to have something that kind of simplifies that process, particularly for people who, you know, kind of maybe don't want to get into kind of the details of that, um, just make it more accessible for a wider audience to make use of the DocuSign service through the Mule platform. Um, other reasons that you might do so is, you know, kind of if your particular algorithm that, or, you know, kind of what you're trying to implement would be difficult or, or maybe even not even possible to implement in DataWeave. Um, and also just remember that it's very much reusable. So if you've built it in the right way and the ways that we've talked about already, yeah, we've got something that can be reused very easily. Yeah. All right, so enough talking. Let's go ahead and look at some code. So uh, let me jump over into IntelliJ. I've tried to make this as large as I can. Apologies if it doesn't come through too clearly on your screen. Um, I'm going to walk through five files here. Um, now, I think kind of what's worthwhile saying up front is there's only one file that actually does any, if you like, sort of um, implementation work. Yeah. The rest is really plumbing code. Yeah. And I've separated out into a number of different files more for clarity than anything else. Yeah. So you could package this all up within a single Java class file if you wanted to. I've intentionally separated that just so that we can understand kind of how these different things interact, however, yeah, so that uh, kind of it becomes a little bit clearer. But there are only five files here, yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of, and, and none of these are particularly large in size. But let's start off, so this is my top level module or extension class file, yeah. Um, what we see straight away is, I haven't written any code at all here. Yeah. So I've defined the, the name of the class. There's nothing in there. Yeah. 
But what there is, however, is some of our annotations. Yeah, so this line here, at extension name equals DocuSign. Okay, this class is my entry point for an extension that I'm building to the Mule runtime, and its name is DocuSign. Yeah. This extension is going to define some possible error types that I might want to make, um, you know, kind of make use of within my error handling within my flow. Yeah, so it's going to define some new error types that I will see there. It's also going to define a configuration object. Yeah, so that when I'm making use of my component within the DocuSign module, yeah, I'm going to need to enter my and again, this is authentication details in this case, I'm gonna to need to enter those into a configuration object, okay? And then finally, if I'm looking at the XML version of my Mule application, yeah, what's the prefix that I use in the XML? In this case, I've chosen DOCE, yeah, for DocuSign. Okay, so four annotations. So the, the fourth certainly is very much an optional one, but no code here, yeah. Let me come over to my configuration class. Yeah. Now, little bit of code here, but really not very much at all. Yeah. So, key to this is what I've got here is I've defined that within my configuration, I'm going to be requesting the person using this extension to enter two parameters within my configuration object. Yeah. Um, only two parameters, and they are kind of classic authentication things. So, what is the now DocuSign has kind of multiple different um, so they have the idea very similar to Salesforce actually in that they have a sandbox environment and a production environment so which one of those am I hitting yeah so what's the base path to access the uh, sort of token system and then for DocuSign what they also want to know so very similar to any sort of authentication scheme you might expect is okay what's the user that I'm connecting to the DocuSign service as? Yeah? Um, and they have this sort of way of defining users for um, sort of when we're accessing through this way. So they, they prefer us to use a GUID rather than sort of a traditional email address or something like that. You can still log into the DocuSign service using an email address, but this GUID is a representation of that same user. Okay, so two parameters. I say what the display names are. So how do I want these to appear within any point studio? Yeah. And I can also provide example values. Yeah. So that's just to help the person using my extension to say, okay, here's the sort of value that you're probably going to want to put into this particular uh, parameter. Okay. And then just some get methods that just return uh, access those parameter variables. Okay. Move on to my error type. Yeah, to remember in my extension, I said this extension or my extension class rather, this extension is going to implement some new errors that I might choose to handle inside my error handling inside my flow. So I've got two different errors here. Yeah, um, and actually the the errors provider piece here is just saying, okay, actually when it comes to um, sort of raising those particular errors. When I'm using them, those either of those can be raised at the same time within my operation. Yeah. So, so here, this is the bit that's actually doing the work. Yeah. I'm saying potentially this public method and anything that I've defined as a public method within my operations class essentially will become a component within AnyPoint Studio. Yeah. So I'm saying this component potentially might throw one of those two errors. So make those available within AnyPoint Studio so that somebody can choose to handle those in whatever way they, they wish to. Okay. So kind of a couple of things to note here. So in my code here, I've got an exception handler. Yeah. I've, in my, so in my uh, implementation here, I'm, I'm calling actually a DocuSign SDK to sort of go through this process. Potentially that SDK itself might throw an exception, but when I see those exceptions occur, I'm re-throwing them, but not as the original exception, I'm throwing them as a module exception. And what that tells the runtime engine is, okay, this is one of the um, sort of special types of exception that the Mule runtime should handle as an error, yeah? so that I can, uh, basically it triggers off that standard error handling functionality, so that's, these exceptions, as they're known in Java, yeah, I can handle them as errors within my error handling in my mule flow. 
Okay. Final thing to note here, you notice that the uh, sort of final annotation that we've got here is at media type. Um, so notice here that my my method is returning a string. Yeah. So so actually, when we see the input, um, this in practice, um, so I'm going to be using this component, and it's going to give me back an access token. Very typical for OAuth two. But as I say, we're not using OAuth two because DocuSign puts some additional twists on top of standard OAuth two. Yeah. So what we're returning from this is a string value, but a string value could be many different types of things. Yeah. So in my case, it's just going to be an access token, but a string could be some XML. It could be some JSON. Yeah. It could be a variety of different things. The media type tells the data sense engine within AnyPoint Studio how to handle this. Yeah. So that it can it can intelligently display sort of you know kind of what things might I sort of have inside of this object. So that the you know kind of the person using AnyPoint Studio sort of gets a better sense of what type of information is coming back here. Yeah, that's the purpose of the media type annotation. Okay, so let's actually see this in practice. Yeah, so I'm going to bring up a AnyPoint Studio. So what you'll see here, let me just just get rid of that. Okay, so I've got a very simple uh, kind of flow here. So I've got a listener that's listening on an endpoint. I've got a uh, sort of message enrichment functionality, a transform message that's preparing a JSON payload for me to send over to DocuSign using a standard HTTP request component. Yeah, um, and then sort of I store away sort of the status code that comes back, and I'm doing some transform in terms of the message that I hand back to to the caller of this endpoint yeah so at the moment if i was to execute this and in fact i can do that what we're going to expect to happen is that it will actually whoop, better start it running first of all so let me just go ahead and run that project Okay, so that's deployed. So just making a call, so posting some information to localhost, my endpoint, I'll click on send. Lo and behold, I get a 500 error come back and apologies if this isn't very clear for you to see, but basically a message that says it failed because I was unauthorized. Yeah, so I know that I need to take care of the authorization piece of this, yeah. As I say, nothing unexpected here at the moment, but we know that kind of DocuSign handles authentication a bit a bit differently to a kind of a normal OAuth 2 process. So I've got the jar file here um, on my desktop. So it's available on, on the GitHub repository as well as a release. So you know kind of that's available as well. So if you're building your own extension, so how might you incorporate it into here? So many of you will be familiar. I can go in and I can update my pom.xml file. I can make entries in my XML file for the application itself. But it is also possible to do this through kind of the AnyPoint Studio UI itself as well. So apologies if you uh, if it's difficult to see on the screen here. So I'm coming over to my module area. There is kind of a gear icon here where I can say, okay, what modules am I currently using and what modules do I potentially want to use? Yeah. So if I say I want to add a new module, I'll say I'm selecting it from Maven. Yeah. It's not in my Maven repository just yet. So instead, I'm going to say, okay, actually, I want to install it. Yeah, and I'm going to browse for, okay. So there's my jar file on my desktop. I'll go ahead and install that. So that's pulled into my local Maven repository. And now if I apply and close that, okay. So if you were watching carefully, you'd have noticed a new entry appear here. So now I've got my DocuSign module. Yeah, so that jar file is now represented as this module within AnyPoint Studio. I can go ahead and say, yeah, here's my component, yeah, which gets my access token, and I can drag and drop that into my flow. Now, in my case, I'm going to get my access token just before I send my request to DocuSign. Yeah. 
So let's have a look at what I'm being asked for here. Yeah. So remember that I said in my code, I said, I'm going to require a configuration object and I'm going to require two parameters within that configuration object. So if I come down here, um, you'll see that as very often is the case, yeah. So when I've got this type of setup, I'm being flagged to say, okay, I need to add some additional information in here. So if I click on the plus next to the configuration object, yeah. So here's my DocuSign configuration. And here are the two parameters that I'm being asked for, yeah. So those were the two parameters that we saw in my code, yeah. So in the configuration class, we saw that there were two app parameter annotations with the sort of display names that we said and the example values, remember, yeah? So I see those appear sort of in light gray here, those example values that we saw in the code, yeah? So I'll go ahead and tap in my details. Let me just copy and paste my value. I can't remember that value off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Really, this is very much analogous to, you know, kind of getting um, sort of user uh, credential information from, you know, a DBA if you're trying to access a database, though, for example. Yeah, so it's very analogous to that. Yeah, it's just that DocuSign has this convention around sort of how they um, sort of want us to make use of user IDs. Okay, so I'll say OK to that. So now I've got my configuration that's created. Yeah, I save that. Hopefully, yeah, so that red check mark goes away, so I'm ready to go. Now, before I do um, sort of go, go ahead and test this, though, so standard things that I get by default within my extension, yeah, so without me sort of spe specifying anything in particular, I've got the idea of the advanced section here where I can say, okay, what variable do I want to place that return value into? So I'm going to enter the name of a variable that I want that payload that came back from my component. I'm going to place it into this variable. I can do error mapping as well if I want to. If I click on the plus here, notice that here are the, and again, apologies if this isn't too clear, but the consent required, the invalid request, those options that I had in my class file, yeah, that I'd specified within the error type class, I can see that those are exposed to me through the UI here. Okay. All right, but hopefully with that uh, sort of one change made, yeah, so I've, I'm populating my access token. If I come over to my request to the DocuSign service, yeah, you'll see that actually, and I just, again, apologies if this isn't too clear, I'm making use of that variable in the authorization header, yeah. So assuming that my um, sort of mule runtime has restarted, I'll come back over to ARC, click on send. Oh, I'm still unauthorized. Oh, did I not save it? I don't have to do that. Demos never work first time, do they? Okay. Let me try again. Yep. Okay. This time it's gone through. The, so my call to the DocuSign API has succeeded and it, it will have created an envelope in my case for me. Yeah? So that's the term that DocuSign uses for um, sort of when you're creating an object, it's typically an envelope within their service. Yeah? So not to worry about the detail there. But as you can see, yeah, so with relatively few um, sort of lines of code, yeah? so we saw it was spanning across a number of different files but I did that more for clarity than the fact that you need to do that. But with, you know, kind of a little bit of plumbing work, we can take what might have been a, a sort of a set, a, an isolated Java class, um, and many of you may have these, you know, kind of within your implementations today. It's relatively easy to pick those up and actually make them into full-fledged extensions. And the benefit of doing so is it then means that not only is it easier for you to use potentially, but also more easily used for other people, either within your organization or even externally, if you're wanting to sort of share a connector. Yeah? So that, you know, kind of, as long as you've built it in the right way, put the configuration sort of uh, pieces in the right places, and you're not relying on what else is going on within your mule flow, um, you know, kind of makes it that much easier for mule soft developers who maybe aren't necessarily Java developers, they can pick up your connector and very easily incorporate it into their flows. 
Okay, and I think with that, I'm pretty much at the end. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'll hand it back over to Angel and uh, let's see what questions we have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris, for that great session. I think it's the first time that actually hands-on within our Muse of Meetups in the MIA. So thank you for that. Um, there, we do have a couple of questions, however. There were some that we already tried to answer. The community already was answering. So thank you, Michael Jones, Tony DeFusco, Alex Tidom, Dejim Juan. Uh, there were some questions still pending. We, one is from Michael Jones and Tony DeFusco around the, can you build a new scope as a mule for extension? I added the documentation that you can see in the screen as well right now. That is docs.mulesoft.com, mule SDK 1.1 scopes. So the answer were uh, assuming that is yes, you can. So I will hand it over to you, Chris. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely right. Yeah, so so scopes are something that you can do within your extension. Um, they're, they're probably a, a slightly more complex uh, variety, but yeah. So I, I think key really to understanding this is pretty much everything that we see, um, kind of in terms of functionality, um, it, the connectors that you will commonly use, um, and, and the components that you commonly use are actually implemented using this same SDK um, as is available to you. So, you know, kind of the, there isn't anything kind of going on behind the scenes here. So, you know, kind of, and then, as we mentioned, yeah, the Mule 4 SDK really gives you a rich set of potential capabilities. Excellent. Thank you, Chris, for confirming and for adding on top of the response. There was one more coming from Tony DeFusco around the REST Connect. He's asking if the REST Connect generated connectors use that Mule 4 XML base SDK. Is this correct? I'm actually not sure off the top of my head, I'm afraid, Angel. But um, yeah, certainly we can uh, we can take that as a, as a question to research uh, kind of after our session today. Yeah, well, I was having doubts as well because REST Connect was probably referring to the Exchange Automatic con Generated Connector. So uh, it's, I don't have the answer either. It's something we will need to find out. Uh, sure. There is another configuration question that is another one from Tony DeFusco. When can configuration parameters for a connector be defined as dynamic, meaning set? via data with expression at runtime versus static, only setable at design time. Yeah, so, so actually that's another annotation um, as part of when you're defining your configuration object, um, that there's an additional annotation that allows you to specify whether a value can be dynamic or not. So it, again, it's a very simple thing to do in terms of the class itself. Um, it's just about understanding, you know, kind of what's the right annotation for what I'm trying to achieve. Okay, that's quite clear. Thank you for that, Chris. We will move to the next one. It's from Michael Jones. Uh, I haven't seen one second. This was actually not a question and it was already solved, so it's not an issue. We're moving on to the next one. Uh, Avin BT. How to create the jar file, IntelliJ code? No, that one was already solved as well. So we will move to the fresher questions. Sorry about that, Chris. It's because the, the community fine. already yeah, answered the, the questions for us. So the next one is from Bound High Beetle. Can you should wrap an API using a connector? So wrap an API as a connector. Um, so you, you could do that using the XML SDK if you wanted to. Yeah. So, so basically take, um, if you like, essentially a piece of a flow um, and, and package it up that way. Um, I'm not sure it would make sense to use the Java SDK to build that. I think the XML SDK would be the best option there, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, at least, yeah. Yeah, and I will add on top of that because you can generate every time that you're published an asset into Exchange, you will get this connector automatically generated for you that you can consume as well. So it will depend on the use case. Yeah. Uh, with that, we move to the next question. Uh, this one is from Michael Jones. Will a custom scope have the same issue that parallel for each scope had? So will a custom scope have the same issue the parallel for each scope had? 
got to be honest, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. It's okay, Chris. Michael, if you can please extend on that question and we'll try to address it. We still have around five minutes more, so we'll try to keep moving. So the next one is from Sergey Blasov. How can build a connector which should use a connection pool? How can you build a connector that should use a connection pool? Yeah, so, um, so so we did touch upon this kind of on the way through. I, I didn't show it in my example code because kind of it wasn't appropriate in my particular connectors case. Yeah, but there is that connection provider um, sort of uh, concept within the the object model within the SDK, and that is exactly for this purpose. Yeah, so so actually um, the the database connector again that's that's out on GitHub. If you want to see the details of how to sort of manage a connection pool, um, definitely worthwhile having a look at the data base connector um, and that will give you you know kind of a good feel for how that works essentially what you have to do when you're implementing you know kind of that connection provider interface is you have to specify okay kind of a connect method a disconnect method but also a validation method to say okay can I, can I validate that a particular connection can still be reused or not or do I have to establish a new connection yeah so um, but yeah so have a look at that connection provider interface um, as I say that one does require a bit more work in terms of the code because you have to tell me all um, okay you know kind of what are the rules around when a connection can be reused or not if it's in a pool already Okay, excellent. Thank you, Chris. That was very insightful. We're going to move to the next one. And it's from Bound High Beetle. How does a Mule 4 connector perform compared to a Mule 3 transport? Not talking about DevKit. So how does a Mule 4 connector perform compared to a Mule 3 transport? Um, so uh, you might want to jump in on this one as well, Angel. So I, I'm less familiar with Mule 3 than I am with Mule 4. Um, so I, I think what, however, things to keep in mind, yeah? So, so there are standard things that we should think about. Whenever we've got, you know, so ultimately I've got some Java code that sits behind my connector. So there, at some point we're going to have to pay the price of loading those classes into the virtual machine. So there will inevitably be a startup cost for kind of that first establishment of pulling them into the virtual machine. Um, so, so there may be, you know, a penalty that we pay for that. Hopefully it's not a particularly heavy penalty, but, but compare that to sort of what we're doing in Mule 3. So it may be that that startup time is slightly increased, but kind of once it's into virtual, into uh, kind of virtual memory, then it should perform very well. That's uh, great, Chris. I don't have anything to add there. I'm still uh, need to refresh on Mule Four connectors. And thanks you for this session today. It's also for me very <laughs> useful. Sure. And and the next topic. Uh, this we still have two minutes more. We will try to do our best. And the next one comes from Alex Tidom. If I build a connector, can I donate it to Mulesoft so it becomes part of the set of connectors available in Exchange? Yes. Um, so, so there is a process for this, in fact, um, that is kind of listed in the documentation. Um, so, yeah. The, the, so, really, what we want to have is in, ensure that there is support for a connector, as I'm sure you can appreciate. What we don't want to be is in the situation where somebody develops a connector, donates it, and then, you know, kind of six, 12 months later, someone's using that connector and it's like, oh, okay, I've got this issue with this connector. Who do I go to, to to address this? So, so there is a degree of, you know, kind of we want to be sure that you've got the appropriate sort of resources in place to provide support for the connector. Um, because as I hope you can appreciate, we don't want, you know, kind of exchange littered with lots of connectors that aren't being maintained. Um, so, so there is a, a little bit of work that our sort of partner team will do just to make sure that you have the appropriate resources in place but yeah absolutely you can do that so as i say there are kind of a few sort of governance checks um sort of involved in submitting it to exchange but but there definitely is a path to do so so as i say there's a link in the documentation that provides you with the details for that okay excellent chris now i'm trying to consolidate around 10 different questions that were around the <laughs> same thing it was related to the icon People were really keen into seeing how you created that icon for the connector, and mm -hmm. if it needs to be a PNG image, if it needs to be SVG, and there were some 
some people are really checking your repository, Chris, actually. Yeah. And they're seeing the docu uh, dash uh, connector slash icon slash icon dot SVG. That is yeah, the place where it. you have yeah, so, so that is the answer, yeah. So um, so Anypoint Studio expects, and, and this is part of packaging up our, our extension, yeah. So Anypoint Studio by default is going to look for, exactly as you've said, icon.svg in a particular location within the jar file. So it can obviously, you can put whatever SVG you want in there, um, but it does need to be an SVG because we want it to um, display well as you scale up and down, yeah. So, uh, so it does need to be an SVG file. Okay, excellent. And again, Chris, this were the people were really interested in knowing about the icons. Thank you for that. And they are going to really see it in the repository. I'm adding it here again, just in case that uh, you have missed it. Please find it here. Find the repository in this URL. You can find and, it. And remember, it, it, it's only my code. So if you spot any bugs in the code, they're, they're entirely mine, I'm afraid. Um, kind of uh, any requests for patches are very welcome. <laughs> yes, a uh, small disclaimer there. Remember, there is another MuleSoft support product just with the data with Playground. It's something that we're releasing, and in this case, was all made by Chris, and it's releasing it so you can learn and help you integrate it with DocuSign. Okay, uh, I'm afraid that we need to cut the Q&A, and we'll have to move to the next part of the session, which will be the trivia. So before we do that, Thank you again, Chris, for making the time to join the community session, to prepare this uh, this uh, session as well, to come with the Q&A, taking all the insightful questions that we have. And yeah, th thank you for joining us. No, you're very welcome, Angel. Uh, glad, glad to uh, join up with the team here. Great. OK, Chris, uh, with that, we're going to move to the trivia. And uh, again, thank you for the great session. Now. For everyone that is interested in some prizes, we will have a trivia right now. If you are not interested in winning uh, new prizes, this is not the place. So please stay with us. These are the two courses that we're offering. Any point platform.